It's just all about the love of God. It is everything he's done for us is because of his love. But it's even more than that. So you're with me in 1 John chapter 4, right? Um, in, in verse 16, it says this. And we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. But there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not make, made perfect in love. And what we're going to lay out to you today by the Holy Ghost is the idea of this love, because I have it, I know it, I've seen it, not only in, in, in my experience, in our experience, through ministry days and years, but we, we hold ourselves back because we, oftentimes we don't know where to put the love of God. And sometimes we, we have doubt about the love of God. And sometimes we put the love of God even unconsciously at times off to the side because of things that are happening, going on or whatever. And we're going to cut through that. The Holy Ghost is going to cut through that by his word today into our lives. And you're going to be in an opportunity to receive today a blessing, the blessing in your life by his grace, his mercy, his love. Because what it says here in, in John, 1 John 4, 16, we have known and believed. This is what he wants for all of us. Not only to know. We can all know. We can all read something. We can all hear something, and therefore we can have knowledge of and know something. We know that. We have that. Because the Amplified puts it this way, we understand, we recognize, and are conscious of. But in this knowing, he wants us to move past just a knowledge, just an intellectual knowledge, that we can repeat this scripture to somebody. He's looking at us from the standpoint of wanting us to be conscious of. Being conscious of. And by observation and experience to be conscious of. Be conscious of, not, not build it up, not make it happen, but it happen. When I'm home, I'm conscious that I'm home. I don't walk around and say, this is my living room. I'm conscious. This, oh, thank God, this is the bathroom. You know, no, it's an everyday, all the time thing. You can be conscious of this every day, all the time. I don't know about you, but there are times I'll go into a, a, a parking lot uh, uh, at a mall or something, and I'll get into, I'll see a parking spot. Sometimes when I'm not feeling as fat as I am, I want to get close. <coughs> and the parking spot will be there, or someone will move out, and I'll just pull right in and say, thank you, for, this is the favor of God. And I, I'll repeat that all the time, no matter what happens. What happens with my kids? What happens in our lives? What happens here? It's just the favor of God, the love of God operating, being conscious of by experience. And not, I don't let, I try not to let one experience drop from me. I don't care how small. I don't care how small. Because I, I want to know and see God in everything, everything, everything. Even when I mess up. I want to see God because, honestly, that's the best time to see God and to know God. And we're, we're going to get into that. And so then it goes on to say, but not only know this, but believe. In other words, have faith in, be, be fully persuaded of that God loves us. Because there's a lot of voices in the world. There's a lot of things that go on. There's a lot of things that attack us. Circumstances, people, Christians. How would you like to start ministry? going down West Side Drive in Chile, New York, and stop at a railroad track because there's a train going there, and the Lord come into your car and tell you, I'm going to send you for ministry and be trained, and you'll have darts thrown at you by my people and hear a, just feel a grieving sense about the whole thing. And then have him repeat it again to you, darts thrown at you by my people. Oh, oh, it's a good thing I didn't know much then. I, don't, I only know a little bit more now. But those things go on because it's to be fully persuaded in. But it's not just in, in anything. It's to be fully persuaded 
in the love that God has for us. The Amplified puts it this way, the love God cherishes. God cherishes what he has for us. I never saw that before. He's been opening up my eyes so much over these last three, four years, and even last night as I'm going into this message, even this morning, I, I had to look up that word cherishes. It means to cling to tenderly. It means to hold dear, nurture, and care for. This is what God thinks of who he is and how he loves us. We shouldn't deny that. And we shouldn't just take it for granted. Although when you walk conscious of it, it becomes effortless. That's all I can tell you. And it just comes up at times and you're, su you're just surprised. And then he showed me this this morning. I was shocked. You have, you have to remember, to me, the, the word is a living word. I could read the same script. There was a time, okay? There was a time. I mean, I went to Bible school. I studied like a fiend. I, I mean, I studied everything all the time. And, and I, I, plenty of knowledge. I, I could say the Bible forward and backward, read it all, blah, blah, blah. You know, but when, he, when I've heard God is love. I taught God is love. And then this morning, I'm looking at, he brings up to me, God is love. And you know what? He brings up the word is to me. God is. God is. God is. And I thought, oh my gosh, how many times have I seen that? You know, I, I had a teacher in Bible school who said this to us. If the word of God is old to you, it's not real to you. And I can understand that because even over the years, I've let the, the, let the word of God become old. In other words, heard it before. We, I had people come into my church, Elver and Mercer, when we were pastoring. I, I remember one guy, you know, met him afterwards, says, yeah, I heard all this stuff before, so I need to go help another church. I, I said, oh, really? Okay, we won't go into that one. But the idea, he said, God is love. I looked up the word love. Yes, yes. God is love. I, I know it. You have to forgive me. I know what he's saying to me right now. I don't forgive me. I just, I understand what's going on here. God, those who come to God must believe that He is, and He is the rewarder of them who seek Him. You must believe God is, and God is. I looked up the word "is." It means be, not become. Not was, not is, or has been. He be, God be, God be love. He be love. If you believe in God, you believe that he is, he is. He's not trying to become. He's not showing love to you. He is, which means it's the only way he can operate. It's the only way he can move. It's the only way he can be in our lives. God is, and that hit me like a ton of bricks this morning. And do you realize God is love sets us apart from every religion, every belief system that has ever been? When's the last time you heard a song about Buddha, how loving he is? Or Confucius, who only causes confusion? Mohammed, you'll never hear his love. God is. He has set himself that way. That's why we don't have a religion. We have a relationship with the almighty God, a living being who loves us and is love because he can be no other way. If I were to take the time to go through the Old Testament with you, you can, you'll see the love of God everywhere. Even at times when it seems like, whoa, did God do that? Yeah, God did that because of love. And he knew what he was doing. He'd be and then it says in verse 17, herein is our love made perfect in the fact that he is. Because it goes on to say in the Amplified that in this union and communion with him, it's union and communion in, with love. Okay. It's not just union and communion with what he can give you. And he's given us all things. It's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Never. He takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. And it's in that union and communion with him that we, we, we can see his face. We know his face. He's turned his face toward us. In the Old Testament, Moses had a tough time with that. Moses wanted to see God in all his glory. 
And God said, I, I, nope, if I show you my face, you're going to die. You can't do that, basically. And then God went by him with his backside. Remember that? He would put Moses in the rock. But in this covenant, he shows us his face. He has turned everything to us. You don't have to keep looking for his hand when you see his face and you see how much he does love you and you see how much his eyes show how much he loves you. And when you consider where love really is and how love really can be, you also will have this boldness because love is made perfect, it says, and that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, a confidence in the day of judgment. This boldness and this confidence in the day of judgment is so important because we need to know we're not being judged by God. We're being loved by God. And do you understand how many Christians have a hard time with what I just said? I cannot tell you how it drives me bonkers when I hear, you know, God's judging America and God has had enough of America. It's like, really? Honestly. Really? He's had enough of America. Last time I checked, there are a whole bunch of other countries doing a whole bunch worse things in a whole bunch worse ways. How come we never hear he's, not had, he's had enough of Denmark? Oh, he's not enough of Spain. Really? God is love? Is he love? We, we have to understand there's a day of judgment coming, but not for you. It can't come for you. Because God hasn't judged you. He saved you. He redeemed you by his love because he is love. And by his love is not what you think. It's not that love endures long and patient and kind. Love takes not into account an evil done to it. Pays no attention to a suffered wrong. 1 Corinthians 13. We all know the love chapter. And that's all part of it, but that's not it. This boldness as we have it is because God is love. And what that means and how he loved us and how much he loves us. And then it goes on to saying, we've all heard this before. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. I mean, that's a mantra in Christendom. We under, we, we've heard this plenty of times. But what I'm here to tell you is this. This love, this love that casts out this fear, so many times we just put it in the context of fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of not having things not working. It's all part of it. But in this context, and what God is trying to tell us out of this chapter, is that there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. And the fear he's talking about goes back to the understanding of that day of judgment, that there is no punishment. This fear is the thought of punishment and being punished by God. And you think to yourself, well, I know that. Listen to me. I can't, I, I, listen, I'm just following after the Holy Ghost here, man. We're just doing what he wants us to do. But that's the wrong kind of fear, the failure and rejection. The fear is God's not going to punish us. You know, I don't know about you, but how about unconsciously? Have you ever thought of unconsciously when things aren't going right? Or you may have done the same mistake how many times? You're thinking, surely God's had enough of me. And sometimes if something happens because of a consequence or a decision made because of that mistake, sin, or whatever, something happens, you think to yourself, hmm, maybe God did that to teach me something. Maybe God's trying to show me something. Maybe God is against me, so I need to turn around and act right. But if God is love, it has nothing to do with you. Because perfect love is not the idea, the fact that it's, you know, it's wonderful. I mean, it, it, the idea is it's correct in every detail, and it is, but it's more than that. When he talks about perfect love, he's talking about this love that accomplished the will of God for man. He's talking about the fact that it's flawless on every level. He's talking about the fact that there's no defects, it's complete, complete, no shortcomings. This is the love he's talking about. This is the perfect love, not your perfect love. Your love can't be perfect. 
Your love never will be perfect because you can't be perfect. Are you listening to me? Trudy prayed by the Holy Ghost. I heard her. She prayed by the Holy Ghost and said, even though we may sin, you don't turn your back on us because there's a reason for that. There's a reason when we begin to understand all that the love of God accomplished and how that love is made perfect, complete, lacking nothing. The love of God lacks nothing. There's nothing you can give to the love of God that will make the love of God cast out the fear, the dread, and everything else that goes on to your life about any type of punishment, any type of circumstance that may come up thinking, oh, my gosh, God's after me. Or maybe it's something I did, so now I have to get right. Now, I'm not against that, but there's a context to that. There's an understanding for that. It's not like the Amplified says here. He puts it this way. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full-grown, complete, perfect love turns out or turns fear out of doors and expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment and so he who is afraid has not reached full maturity. It brings the thought of punishment. I don't know about you guys, but I've ministered for a while. I was a pastor for over two decades. And I thought I needed to be perfect. And when I messed up, and when I messed up with the same thing again, or I even messed up the third time, my kids will tell you, Trudy will tell you, there was nothing like putting on sackcloth and ashes like they did in the Old Testament with a great big pity party thinking, how can I be so stupid? How can God and why would God want to do anything with me or for me? I put myself into my own cave. I called it going into a tank because I was expecting that I didn't, I didn't live up to all that God did when he lived and came down. And that's a killer. That is a killer. And then I come to realize this is perfect love that casts out fear. Perfect love that has nothing to do with me. I don't have to run around showing. Now, hold on. I, know, I hear it. I hear you. But I'm going to explain it. I, I hear it in this. I'm telling you, this is amazing to me. But anyhow. I realized that it's all about him and nothing about me. And the thing about it is, when I make God is the root in my life, the fruit becomes easier. And the fruit becomes in living as God is. Because even as it says here in these scriptures, as he is, so are we in this world. And it's, it's all about that. It's, it's, it's not about fear as in, again, dread. God's going to get me. Something's going to happen to me. There was a time I had one foot that came down. I was always waiting for the other. Three was a good number for me at one point, and it wasn't the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. It was, you know, good, bad things come in threes. It used to be third time was a charm, but I was just waiting for the third thing to happen. Say, okay, what's up next? And that was an unconscious thing of being that way because of everything going on. I'm thinking, where is God? What's going on with God? It's not that type of fear that this scripture is talking about. Not the fear of rejection, but it's a fear of punishment with God. There's types of fear. The Bible talks about fearing God. We know this, right? You've heard this before. But it's not fearing that God's going to get you, God's going to punish you, God's going to whack you across the head. Will he always be there for us? Yes. Will he always train us and lead us? Yes. Let, let me show you this in, in Psalm. Holy cow. Psalm 130. Psalm 130. I'm going to show you this, and I'm going to thank the Lord for it. In Psalm 130, in verse 3, it says this, If thou, Lord should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand. Think about that for a moment. In verse 3, it says, Lord, if you take into account the stupidity, the sin, the missing of the mark in our lives, who can stand? Who knows the answer to that question? Who can stand? 
A, no one. B, no one. C, no one. D, all of the above. D, all of the above. Okay, because that's, did you see? Oh, man. Okay, hold on. All right. Who shall stand? Now listen to verse 4. But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And when you look and understand this word feared, you just found out if anybody, if you should mark iniquities against this Lord, who's going to stand? That would make me afraid. That would cause dread in my life. Because I, I like to think I'm not the only one here with iniquities. And it's not something you get a giant eagle on sale for three for a dollar. And then he goes on to say, ha, but there's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Again, not taking a step back. I mean, when there's forgiveness, who doesn't run toward forgiveness? Who does not run toward forgiveness? Who is not set free by forgiveness? Who doesn't find a, a, a new path or, or, or a second chance, so to speak, in life with forgiveness? But yet the Bible says you're to be feared for that. But what it's saying here is you're to be revered. You're to be honored. You're to be put in awe because in spite of who I am and what I've done, there's forgiveness because God is love and in love is forgiveness. There's not any punishment by God. There will be on the very last day. But you're, you're through that by the love of God. You're through that by his blood. You're through that in that you were made the righteousness of God. He said, you can look at, in Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10, that this is the new covenant in my blood. This is it. Your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. All right. Because I, I hear it, let me, let me explain this to you, okay? This is what we're saying. We're saying this. There's no more punishment because we're not under the New Testament. We're not under the covenant of sin and you die. In Romans 8, it talks about that we are under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, having been set free from the law of sin and death. You either have it or you don't, and you have it. You may know it, but do you believe it? Are you conscious of that? Because it's the only thing that's going to make us. You ever try to tell somebody, yes, I know you made a mistake, you sinned, but run to God. How many of you have had a hard time running to God when you've been in that situation? A few of us, I bet. Because we don't know what God's going to do. Same way with Adam, where it all started, in the garden. When he ate of the fruit, the Bible says Eve was deceived. Adam phew, was right there and went for it. And then God came in the garden, and God goes walking around calling, Hey, Adam, where are you? Like he didn't know. And he said, Lord, heard your voice. I was naked, and I was afraid. Why do you think he took those salad leaves off of Adam and Eve and came up with the first blood sacrifice and the fact that he gave them animal skin. There was a purpose for that because he knew of the one who was going to be slain from the beginning of the cosmos, from the beginning of time. He knew Jesus. We're, uh, Romans 8, 2, we're not under the law of sin and death. We're under the law of the spirit of Christ, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and are free from. That's why when you mess up, you can run to God. You may not be able to run to a Christian who might look at you and say, Oh my gosh, you did that. Holy cow. Whoo, dog, stay away. I've known men as this. Oh man, I, I don't want to go into that. Okay, we got, we got three more hours. Let's not go into that. But that's why you can run to God. You can run to God because God is love, not that he might be love. You know, a lot of Christians like to go to the, you know, how many times Peter went to, to uh, 
Jesus, how many times are we supposed to forgive our brother? You know how many times Jesus told him? 70 times 7, which is 490. I think I know some Christians who counted to the point when they get to 491, they thought they were free. Yeah, baby. And do you, does anybody have any idea why he used 490? Because the land in Israel was supposed to be set free on its own every seven years, what they call the Sabbath year for the land. And Israel did not do this 70 times the seven years. And that's why he brought it up in that fashion. And so, because we're free, we're not saying that you know, you turn a blind eye to sin. No, God chooses to remember our sin no more. Like he said, and like the psalmist said, if, if you decide to impute sin, David said, if you decide to impute sin, if you put the iniquities onto our account, who's going to stand? Nobody. But thank God when we miss it, we can stand. Because we're in the spirit of life in Christ. I stand in Christ. Noah and his family were in the ark, which is a type of Jesus Christ. And boy, if I, one of these days I'd like to share that with you guys. But Moses, I'm sorry, Noah fell. And you know where Noah fell? He fell in the ark. He fell in Jesus, and he got back up again. Just like a righteous man may fall seven times, and the Lord picks him up every time because God is love. And, and, and he shows this love to us. It's not a blind eye. He loves us and not, he, he, he wants, doesn't want us to destroy ourselves through sin. That's why he's against sin when we do it. And he's going to send people to you to help you, to pick you up, to dust you off, to show you no condemnation, no guilt, no shame, no punishment. And it has nothing to do with you. You're off the hook. There's no penance. There's only believing and receiving by trusting in what this word says without any preconceived ideas or holding on to a new covenant which God himself said he found fault in. And he found fault in this new covenant because it had everything to do what man had everything to do. And when he gave us a new covenant, it had nothing to do with man. It had everything to do with Jesus. And if Jesus didn't care about the effects of sins, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. We understand this. There are effects to sin. We understand it. But the gospel declares that God's love for us is unaffected by our choices. We are affected by our choices. That's why if God looks at you to deal with you about what's going on in your life, because he's concerned about the choices you could make and could and maybe have made. Have you ever heard of a guy by the name of Abraham and not Lincoln? Abraham. Okay. Do you know that when Abraham first went down to Egypt and he took his wife with him, you know what he did? He told Sarah this. He said, hey, you are one hot chick. And I don't want to have anything happen to me because you're so hot. So tell everybody as a hot chick, you're my sister. Real spiritual reasoning, huh? How about that? He's going to save his own skin and literally give up his wife to the Pharaoh who did take her and put her in her harem. harem. And he didn't do that because he needed another beautician to fix his hair. Was Abraham care about that one? No. He says, no, I, you're hot. Don't tell him you're my wife. Because if you do, I could die. And we know what happened in that story, don't we? God came on the scene, explained the situation to Pharaoh, right? And Pharaoh went to Abraham and said, dude, what you doing? Why are you doing this? Look at what you did. Take your wife and go. And he went. And you know how, how he went? He went with being rich in cattle, servants, other livestock. 
Woo-hoo-hoo. Isn't that amazing? Now, of course, how many of you know Abraham learned his lesson? Never did it again. Nobody does because it's not what happened, right? Then he goes down to Gerar a number of years later. Guess what he does? Sarah, <laughs> it's amazing, but you're still hot. You really are. But listen, I, I don't need the, the king of this place to do anything to me. So do me a favor. Let everybody know you're my sister, so it'll go well with me. I, I think you'll be okay. We'll, we'll find out, but so it goes well with me. And we know the story of what happened with that one too, don't we? God showed up again, spoke to Abimelech, and Abimelech said, hey, dude, you know what could have happened to me because of you? And God said to Abimelech, said, hey, this, guy's, this guy is a prophet, and that's his wife. It's like, whoa, did you see this? This is his second time he shot himself in the foot with his choice and decision. God calls him a prophet. God says that's his wife. God goes to the wrong man and says, leave him alone. Why didn't he go to Abraham and say, Abraham, man, don't do this again. What's your issue? Amazing. Amazing. And he walked out of there, what? Even more rich than what he was. That was a time of grace under the old covenant. The law didn't come till later. And that's a different story. But you see, even when the gospel declaring that we're not unaffected by our choices, it does not follow that we can act without consequences of sin, i.e., shooting yourself in the foot. But even with all those consequences, it's not by God. Through sin, we can open a door for trouble. God doesn't want that in your life. He doesn't want that in my life. You can open the door to the devil. Yo. But not, but God is still our loving father. And we are still his dearly loved children. Amen. In fact, we got to go quick here. Luke, Luke chapter 4, real fast. Luke chapter 4 says this. When we just talked about in Psalms, it also refers to Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 20. Because look at, what, look at what he does in Luke 4, okay? Look at what he does in Luke 4 when he's, when he's uh, tempted by the devil. He says this. The devil says in verse 6 of Luke 4, And the devil said unto him, All the power will I give you, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomever I will give it. If you will, therefore, worship me, all, shall, all of this will be yours. And Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. He took that directly from Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, those exact words were used except for this. It says, You shall fear the Lord in Deuteronomy. And Jesus answered it and quoted that by saying, You shall worship the Lord. Because there's a type of fear that is in worship and not in punishment. But we hear so much about this punishment. It's been taught so much in our lives and we hear so much in churches that we need to fear God's punishment. Because if you don't live your, you, you line up your life right, stop the nonsense, straighten up, do what you're supposed to do, bam, you're done. But that's gone, isn't it? it, either, it you either believe that or you don't. You may know that. But do you believe that? Are you conscious of that? Are you conscious of that? Because you think to yourself, well, then who else is doing it in my life? Hello? You? And there's also a devil out there. Because God doesn't want us to think like that. We know there's a devil out there. Okay? And the idea behind the devil is this. The devil is going to mess up and mess around with our lives. It's going to happen. He's going to play with our circumstances. He's going to do that. But when we understand this perfect love, when we understand that is what, what was accomplished by the will of God in Jesus, 
when we grab that, it means God for, uh, God's love for us is done, done, done. It's rightly done, completely done, nothing missing, no more to be added, nothing for us to do, nothing to add to, nothing. We're loved unconditionally. No condition. That's tough in our lives because of what we can, are conditioned in the natural world, let alone what we've been brought up and even heard in church when we were younger. Those brain pathways are still there unless you change them. In, in, in our society, it's, it's meritocracy. It's how well you do based on how well you do and how far you go based on how far you go by how well you do. But in Christianity, it's done, 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 done. That brings a boldness. That brings a confidence. That brings a trust that I can go to God, keep walking with God, seeing God do things in my life because I don't wake up every morning and say, what sin can I do today? Bless God, let's give him the test. No, I live from the root of my life and I attempt to, which is the love of God, which I believe will produce a fruit because right believing always produces right living. It's not the other way around. It's not what I do that I can depend on the love of God. It's what he did that I can depend on the love of God, that I'm set free from the law of sin and death. And I can even understand when I shoot myself in the foot, he will work all things together for my good, even though there may be some consequences otherwise. He'll turn it around. He'll turn it around, just like he did with Abraham. I'm telling you, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I get into this situation, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, God, holy cow. I just shot myself in the foot. Immediately what comes in my heart is Abraham. How about Peter? Peter was like a lot of us. Oh, I got a message on Peter I think you guys would love. But Peter's like a lot of us. Open mouth, insert foot, got it all together, all the time, everywhere. Jesus, I'll tell you what, man, if everybody leaves you, I ain't leaving you. Oh, you and me are solid brothers. Called together, amen. And what did, what did Peter do? What did Peter do? Denied the Lord in swearing and in cursing. Now, it's not like swearing and cursing like we do in the 20th century, 21st century. It's a different scenario. But what, what happened then? What happened then? When Jesus came off that cross and was raised from the dead, and I think it was Mary Magdalene who came to him, he said, go tell Peter and the others, I'm coming. And then it talks about in the Bible where that he appeared to Cephas and the others. Do you realize he went to Peter? The Bible doesn't tell us what was discussed, but he went to Peter for what reason? Bring him back. He went to Cephas. He appeared to Cephas and the others. This is what God wants to do for all of us all the time. So don't judge his love for us in any way other than this way. And again, it's not by circumstances. Negative, bad, ugly. We need to judge his love for us simply by the cross. Not just a symbol to wear around your neck, but by the cross. Because the devil can attack our circumstances, we can make our own mistakes, but the devil cannot attack the cross. It's a done deal on the cross. And our mistakes cannot separate us from the love of God like Abraham because of the cross. The cross is where we see that God is love because God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself and not imputing their trespasses to them. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. For what reason? He came unto his own, his own received him not. But he put him on the cross because there on the cross, the accomplishment of God's will was done. To defeat, and his purpose was to, to defeat all that the enemy had tried to do, the devil, and to move us from the law of sin and death to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's 
the love of God. The devil will keep us self-occupied. He'll tempt us to see ourselves by our circumstances. Why this? Why is that? Where's God? Blah, blah, blah. Can circumstances change? Yes. But through our trust and faith in God, we'll change them. And that's why it says, faith worketh by love. And we keep thinking it's our love. Uh-uh. Your faith in God will work by him working and believing, you believing in his love for you. Faith work is by his love for you. I know I can keep going when I make a mistake because I have faith and trust in God's love for me. When I make a mistake, I trust and have faith in God's love for me. When I lay hands on a person, I've read books by Christian ministers that said, don't even pray with someone who you know is in sin. Well, what are you supposed to do? Who's perfect? Don't lay hands on somebody. They might have a devil. Then cast the devil out. Because God doesn't... Um, okay, get ready. Here we go. The devil will keep us self-occupied by tempting us to see ourselves in our circumstances. But you know what? Faith works by love, and it works this way. How much and how God loves us. It isn't a formula. It's a person who went to the cross. It takes a long time sometimes, I think, for us to realize faith is not a formula. Faith is a person. The author and finisher or developer of our faith is a person. And his name is Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Love is God. It's Jesus on the cross. If we will just continue to focus on the cross and see what he's done for us on the cross, his love was perfected because it took our sin, took our iniquities, took our transgressions, took our sickness, took our disease, took our curse that was his love that was his love finished his love completed I, I can't tell you I'm hearing so much in the spirit with ding dong bing bong bing bong in our heads and now I know why he told me what he told me here this morning I know why now he told me what he told me before I came here how it all came together this morning. Either this is what you know and believe or it's not. Because you may know it, but if you don't believe it, guess what? It's not going to operate in your life like it could and like it should. I want to show you one more in Mark 5. I'm cutting this. It's okay. We're following the Spirit of God. You guys are with me. In Mark chapter 5, I want to show you something that God is love. And how much we can see Jesus. When we look at the cross, everything is there. Everything was purchased for us there. Everything was done for us there. And when he was raised from the dead, he was raised for our justification. Because death couldn't hold him down. Death can't hold you down. The law of sin and death can't hold you down. Keep trying to make something happen in your life. Look at Jesus because in Jesus it has already happened for us and I'm going to lead you in a confession here in just a little bit because this is what the Lord wants us to do and when I do we're going to be focusing on Jesus not on you we're going to be focusing on Jesus and what he did and not on you we're going to be focusing on everything he accomplished for us in the love of God by the love of God because he is the love of God not on you and I guarantee you if you receive this today God's going to touch you and come to you right where you are right now. Whether it's healing for you, whether it's deliverance for you, whatever it may be. And I'm going to show you, because this is, you're over in Mark chapter 5, listen to this. We all know this story. In verse 25, it says this, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, came and pressed behind, touched his garment. 
For she said, if I touch but his clothes, I'll be made whole. And straightway the fountain of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And the disciples and said to you, what are you talking about? Who touched me? Everybody's touching you. Everybody's around you touching you. And you're saying, who touched you? Are you kidding me? But Jesus was touched by a woman who had an issue of blood who should not have been there. She should have been struck dead in stoning because she shouldn't be there according to the law. She should not be there. But she heard something about Jesus. And every time I've touched this and heard this from others, it said, well, they heard that Jesus healed. Yeah, he did, but she heard more than that. Because Jesus healed all. He never said, this table. How are you guys doing with your life? You know, you guys doing okay? Did you have a good week? You didn't mess up? Did you argue anything like that? No? Did you sin? Okay, did you, have you prayed enough? Have you even read three scriptures? Have you read three chapters? Have you, have you fasted at all? No? Okay, I'll get you guys later. It's over there. All right, how are you doing, young man? You have a good week? I did. You did? You did everything you were supposed to do? Perfect, good, upright, righteous? You all pray for it. How's this table doing? You guys doing okay? Have you argued at all? You've argued? Okay, over there. All right, what about you guys? What's going on here? Anything? Nothing. Oh, how am I supposed Nothing. Really nothing? Did you guys even pray over a meal? Nothing? Like okay, you guys go over there. I'll get you guys maybe later. But maybe what we'll do is I'll go over a few things and tell you what you need to do so you can straighten up and then come to me. Okay? You get it? That's what we do, though. And that's what happens sometimes. That's not what she heard. She heard that Jesus had compassion and healed all who came to him. You think she might be the only one who was under the law? Really? I don't think so. She heard this. She heard that in her time and culture that not only Jesus healed, but he healed all with no judgment. He didn't do what I just did. You're good. You're, you're good. You're not good. Next time. You guys, over here. You got, no, no judgment. No judgment. No judgment. He, she heard, he healed all. She may have had a friend who was healed and should have been judged. That's what stops Christians from getting healed. It's not the fact that you don't say enough word. It's not the fact that you don't say, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. It's not that. It's that you don't believe his love for you has got it for you already. And all you have to do is understand that. There's no judgment because you haven't done enough. We get, our head gets banged up in, in healing services. I mean, I've had healing services in the, churches I, the church I was in. I remember one time there was a healing service. We had a, we had a guest minister, and oh, my gosh, I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing before you, there, was, uh, there were a couple people went up, and I thought to myself, oh, my gosh, there's nothing here. Nothing here. Nothing. And there was nothing because we think we've got to be something or we will receive nothing. You have to be in love with Jesus. You have to see what Jesus has done in his love for you, and he will touch you this morning. Get it out of your brain cells that it's anything else but. At the cross, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace with God was upon him, and by his stripes, we got healed. Do you hear that? He was wounded. You don't have to be. He was bruised. You don't have to be. He took the stripes. You don't have to. You just have to do what this lady says. I believe I'm going to that healing service where Jesus is. And she knew that if I just touched the hem of his garment, and so did Jesus. Jesus knew that. And the thing about it was, what happened? It, it happened. It, and Jesus didn't even know it. Are you listening to me? Jesus didn't stop and tell his disciples, hey, it's a good place to have a uh, healing service right now. You guys got the buckets? You know? 
He didn't do that, did he? And yet the Bible says people were thronging him, touching him. But this one person who knew, and I'm telling you, that there was no judgment with Jesus that she could receive because of him. She went after it. She came from behind. She initiated it. And Jesus said, who touched me? And then when they looked around about in verse 32 to see who did this, the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Why was she fearing and trembling? Because she shouldn't be there? No, it's that honor. It's that in awe of we talked about in Psalm 100. I used to teach it that she was fearing and trembling that God was going to whack her around. And that could have been too. But she was in awe. And maybe she did have that punishment scenario working in her. But what did Jesus say? Daughter. He called her daughter. Show me another scripture in the Gospels where he called someone daughter. Daughter, your faith, your trust. She was maybe thinking punishment, but he called her daughter, looked right at her, didn't turn away and say, oh my gosh, you got to be kidding me. Who told you to do this? Who do you think you are? God, God get out of here. He didn't do that. He said, daughter, your faith. Your faith in what? 1 Peter 2.23, by his stripes I'm healed. What? What was, his, what was her faith in? Her faith was in him, knowing he had nothing against her. And he wanted to make sure she knew it by calling for her and bringing her to him and saying, daughter, your trust in me is what made you whole. Go in peace. Go in peace. Go in peace. No judgment. No punishment. I'm not taking it away from you. I'm not going to hang you for what you did here. And, you know, you weren't even at the meeting. Did you, give a, did you give it an offering? No. No. Call her daughter. <laughs> this is love, folks. This is love. You can't make this stuff up. It's in the Bible. He wants you to know it. Believe it. It's ours. It's yours today because he's alive today and you're in him today. All right. This is what we're going to do. Okay. I, 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 I got this. Conf I wrote this all out. And I want you to say it. All right. Remember I told you at the beginning, God wants to make himself known to you. And this is your moment. It's not your only moment, but it is a moment. Let me put it to you that way. And I want you to receive knowing you can just simply receive. Because God is love. And I want you to see this from the standpoint of the cross. Because his love was accomplished and finished for us at the cross. And it took everything for us. And when we confess this, there's going to be a spot where I'm going to ask you to say to your God and yourself what you need healing for. Maybe you know a loved one who needs healing. Deliverance. This is your day. Not your only day. This is a day for you. Are you with me? Are you, are, are you guys still wondering about whether we're going to pray for people afterward? Yes, we will. And some of you are probably wondering, well, are we going to get out at 12? Yes, you will. Are you guys still wondering about, well, what about my offering? We'll take it. Okay? We'll take it. All right? And what about cake over there? You'll have it. Okay? We're, we'll be good. But I guarantee you, God wants him to make himself known what I'm going to ask you to do is say this with me, but I want you to close your eyes, and, I, and I'm not going to come and do anything to you. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to see Jesus on the cross for you, taking all your sickness, having taken your disease, the chastisement of your peace, the punishment for your peace, wounded and bruised. And this is your time. 
Say this with me. Father God, you love me so much. You didn't want me to suffer the punishment for my own sins. So you took all my sins and put them on your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on that cross. You took all my punishment that I deserved because I sinned, but you didn't want to punish me because you love me. You took all my punishment. You took all my judgment. You took all my curse. And you placed them on your son. And Lord Jesus, you love me so much. You came to carry all this in your own body on that tree. And Father, you took all my diseases all my sicknesses, all my infirmities. Now I want you to put down it to him. No, no, you don't repeat this. At this point, what are those diseases? What are those sicknesses? What are those infirmities for yourself or for anybody else? A loved one, someone you know. Put it out there. I'm telling you, take. Take. It's okay. It's his good pleasure. He gave us the kingdom. Take now. Take now. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. You can say that now. I trust you're all done mentioning for yourself and others. Receive it. Thank you, Father. You took them all from my body. And the body of my loved one, because of your love for us. And you put it all on the body of your son, the Lord Jesus. And Jesus, you took them all in your own body, because you love me. You take them all far from my body in your own body, on the tree of Calvary. And Father, you struck Jesus for my healing. And by his stripes, in his love, and your love for me, I am healed. Hallelujah. Now just let that sit in for a moment. Father, we just give you all the glory and praise. We give you all the glory and praise. Hallelujah. <clears throat> you are the same. You are the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. You are the same. You are the same. And your love for us will never change. You are the same. You are the same, and your power is available for all of us, for all of us who believe you are the same. Behaviors change, people change, but your love always remains the same to us. You are the same, you are the same. And your power is flowing still today for us. You are the same. You are the same. And your love for all remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your love for us will never change. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your unconditional love to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's only you who we adore. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for lifting us up with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. By your love and in your love, freeing us, healing us. 
delivering us, for you never change. You are always the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, you are the same. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you.